Would you take your Bible and turn with me this morning to the book of Hebrews? In the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. And thank you for being here today in this sanctuary service and in the Christian Life Center and those who join us by television and internet. We welcome you and thank you for worshiping with us today. We are in a study of Hebrews because the book of Hebrews is all about Jesus. And I don't want to preach anything in this pulpit but Jesus. Amen? We are here to hear about Jesus and to worship Him. And the opening verses in Hebrews speak to us about the superiority of Jesus Christ. So let's stand together and we're going to read a few of these verses in the first chapter and then we'll look at what God is teaching us today through His Word. Let's begin there with verse 4. Having become so much better than the angels, as He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than all your companions. And you, Lord, In the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Our Father, we thank you for the superiority of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he is one of a kind, that there is no other like him, and there never will be. And we pray that as we study the Word of God together this morning, You would teach us about Jesus and draw us to Him and through Him to you. In the name of Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please be seated and keep your Bible open before you. It's interesting here to see that the writer of Hebrews uses seven different passages of Scripture from the Old Testament to teach us about the superiority of Jesus. So let's look at this together this morning. And I want you to notice first here a name of righteousness. A name of righteousness. Look at verse 4 once again. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. That says, Jesus is superior to the angels. He has obtained a more excellent name, Scripture says. Now, as we think about this word inheritance, it is a word that speaks of wealth. And so here it says, by inheritance he obtained a more excellent name. And we know that the angels have names. For example, there was the archangel Michael mentioned to us in Scripture. The name Michael means one who is like God. There was the angel Gabriel mentioned in Scripture, 
who brought the announcement of the virgin birth. The name Gabriel means man of God. And look carefully at verse 5. Scripture says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. You see, God never said that to any of the angels. And that's a quote from the book of Psalms, from Psalm 2, verse 7, which says, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. You see, that psalm takes us to the empty tomb. It is a psalm foretelling the resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus rose from the dead, he demonstrated a fact. He demonstrated that he is superior to the angels. He demonstrated that he is superior to Confucius. He demonstrated that he is superior to Muhammad. He demonstrated that he is superior to every false god and every no god. He is the superior one. And we see that by the excellence of his name. That's a good place to say amen. It is the empty tomb that proves Jesus is the Son of God. The resurrection validates His Sonship. Romans 1.3 says concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Did you hear that? It said concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's His name, Son It says he was born of the seed of David. That's his birth. That's the incarnation. That's the coming of God to the earth in the form of a man. And the resurrection validates and demonstrates the very fact that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's why in Hebrews 1.5, Scripture says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my Son? I have begotten you. God didn't say that to the angels. God said that to His Son, Jesus. Now go back to Hebrews, the latter part of verse 5. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's a quote from 2 Samuel seven fourteen in the Old Testament. And it points us to the birth of the Lord. It takes us to the cradle. And it teaches us that Jesus is superior to the angels, not only in the resurrection, but also in his birth. Verse 4 in Hebrews 1. He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. I want you to think about the name of Jesus. The Bible says God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Scripture says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So he has obtained by inheritance a more excellent name. And then we see not only in this verse his wealth, but we also see about his worship. Look at verse 6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. That's a quote from Psalm 97, verse 7. The angels worship Jesus. You remember the Christmas story in the Gospel of Luke? And suddenly there was the angel with the multitude of the heavenly host. And what were they doing? Scripture says they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. They were worshiping the name. Of Jesus. So we see a name of righteousness. Then, secondly, we see here a scepter of righteousness. A scepter of righteousness in verse 7. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. That means that the angels ride the winds and go through the fire to carry out the will of God. They have a beautiful responsibility. An awesome role. But none of the angels ever were exalted the way Jesus was. Look at verse 8. It says, but by way of contrast to the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness 
is the scepter of the kingdom. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's a quote from Psalm 45, 6 and 7. And it tells us some things about Jesus. First, it tells us Jesus is permanent. He's permanent. The eighth verse says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. It is a permanent throne. Now, there are no permanent thrones on this earth. Kings come and kings go, but the Bible says the kingdom of Jesus will last forever. His throne will be forever and ever. A thousand years from now, the throne of Jesus will be there. A million years from now, the throne of Jesus will be there. A billion years from now, the throne of Jesus will be there. There will never be a time when the throne of Jesus is not there because His throne is permanent. Jesus is permanent and His throne will last forever. Not only is Jesus permanent, Hebrew says Jesus is perfect. He is perfect. Verse 8 and verse 9, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. In other words, He always does what is right. He is on a throne that is permanent and perfect. And then it tells us here in verse 9 that Jesus is powerful. He is powerful. Verse 9 says, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Now, when Jesus was on this earth, He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And in Luke 4, it says that He stood up to preach and He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. And He ministered in the power of the Spirit of God, anointed with the oil of gladness. And this is an unusual king, this King Jesus. Unlike any other king. All over the earth, there are good kings and bad kings and sad kings and mad kings. But Hebrew says Jesus is a glad king. He is anointed with the oil of gladness. And the word gladness is a word that literally means to leap up and down. To jump up and down with joy. When Jesus died on the cross, He knew that His death would make it possible for you and me and anybody who would receive Him to go to heaven when they die. He paid the price. No angel ever did that. Jesus is permanent and perfect and powerful. We see this scepter of righteousness. And then there is a third thing. And that is a work of righteousness. A work of righteousness in verse 10. Psalm 102, 25 through 27 says, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens of the work of your hands. And that tells us a couple of things. Jesus creates. He works. He he creates. The heavens are the work of His hands. Aren't you glad today Jesus has the whole world in His hands? Amen. It may look bad, but... When it looks bad, you look up because he has the whole world in his hands. He creates, but Jesus also continues this work of righteousness. Verse 11 is a quote from Psalm 102. They, talking about the creation, will perish, but you, talking about Jesus, will remain. And they, the creation, will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed. He's saying that this world of ours will pass away. And not only is everything in it going to pass away, it is going to pass away. He continues. Jesus continues. Cities will crumble and fall, but Jesus remains. He always continues. Go back to Hebrews and look at verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool? Well, that's another quote from the Old Testament from Psalm 110. And then in verse 14, he says, the angels are ministering spirits. Now, let me tell you, I want you to get this straight. I've heard people say, and I've had people say to me, I'll be an angel in heaven. No, you're not going to be an angel when you get to heaven. Angels are created beings. You will not be an angel when you get to heaven. 
The angels are there to minister to us and to worship Jesus. And they are ministering right now in ways that we could never dream of or never think of. Jesus is the creating one, and he's the continuing one. And then Jesus conquers. He conquers. Look at verse 13. It says, his enemies will be made his footstool. That's a graphic picture from custom of the day in which Jesus lived. And that day, a defeated foe would come to the feet of the king that had conquered him. And he would get on his knees and bow down and kiss the feet of the conquering king. And then that king would take his feet and put them up on top of the head of his enemy and make him his footstool. Now, the Bible says there are some enemies in the world. Sin is an enemy. One of these days, Jesus is going to pick up his foot and put it on sin, and sin will be over. There'll be sin no more. Hell is an enemy. One of these days, Jesus is going to pick up his foot and stomp hell, and hell will be over. And then the Bible says death is an enemy. And one of these days, Jesus is going to take his foot and put his foot on death, and death will conquer us no more. Why? Because Jesus conquers. Not only does he create and continue, he, he conquers. And that's the reason Jesus is superior. April 15, 1865, just a few days before, Abraham Lincoln was wounded by an assassin's bullet. They took him right across from the Ford Theater, put him in the bedroom of a house, on April 15, 1865, he died. Secretary Edwin Stanton went to the windows and pulled the drapes, closed the drapes, looked back, and he said, Now he belongs to the ages. For Lincoln, that was really only partially true. The fact of the matter is, the only one who really belongs to the ages is the one to whom the ages belong. That's Jesus. Everything else is going to perish. Every one of us will pass away. But Jesus is superior. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I pray, if you have not done so, that you will give your life to Him today. As we stand to sing, if you will give your life to the Lord Jesus, our pastors will be here to receive you. Should you like to become part of this church family, we welcome you to come and make that decision today. As we sing, you come.